Well, I'm next. Um, hello, I'm Eric von Hippel. Um, probably most of you don't know who the hell I am, but uh, what I do is I study the economics of Open as well as being a hacker myself. And so what I want to do is show you very quickly the economic underpinnings that actually are driving Open. And what you'll see is that there are tens of millions of people who have personal incentives to do Open, and they potentially might or might not be interested in, I love your bunny ears, might or might not be interested in <laughs> Uh, joining the uh, certification process, but it'd be important to think about. So uh, what I'm going to tell you about is two kinds of economic arguments. And you can sort of say, okay, I'm really glad uh, that this exists and I will uh, uh, look back at it if I ever need it. What I'm giving you is a quick outline on, on how this works. And it, the economics behind the profitability of open design differs if you are designing consumer products or if you're designing industrial products. So let me jump into each in turn. Okay, so first the consumer case for open. This guy is named Joseph Schumpeter and uh, he uh, was in the 1930s arguing that really producers were the ones who innovated. And the entire system, economic system of innovation supporting governments and so on, has been built around the idea that producers innovate and consumers follow along. So now we're talking about consumers, household sector people. And the only role they had, consumers, in the traditional model is they might have needs. That's sort of okay. So, I was a hacker, other people are hackers, uh, I knew that wasn't true, you know, we all know it's not true. So we started doing, my colleagues and I started doing studies. We, to document that this wasn't true, we began to do national innovation surveys, nationally representative surveys so that you could project to the country as a whole. There are ten countries now, here are the first three, and I'll just stick to the UK column here. The UK was wonderful because the UK gives you money to do research even if they think it's really stupid. <laughs> they thought the idea of consumers innovating was seriously stupid. So what we did was a survey and, and really carefully screening and doing all the things one does. And what do we find? If you look at that column, we find that 6.1% of the UK population was at home modifying or creating products for their own use. That's 2.9 million people. It is, the, in the entire UK, there are only 22,000 professional R&D people who develop products for consumers. So what this means is the consumers innovating for themselves outnumber the producers by over a hundred to one. And yet they're invisible in the economics because, number one, they shouldn't exist and therefore nobody measures them. But this has been now brought forward and we're measuring it and we even got the OECD definition changed so we're on the road. So the scope is huge. Basically what consumers do is they develop and improve anything they use. They're typically not developing industrial process equipment, but they're developing anything they use. And you all will know about this. So from medical to pet-related, sports and hobby, dwelling, everything. You all know examples infinitely. And what really goes on here is this is an example of a Chinese farmer. Uh, you know, you and I are so proud we drag our suitcase through the airport and it has wheels. How cool is that? But this guy said, well, wait a minute, why shouldn't my suitcase drag me? And so he integrated a, basically a scooter with his suitcase and uh, documented the fact that he could go through 22 kilometers of a Chinese airport, which is about the ordinary size of a Chinese airport. Uh, hold on a sec, I gotta shut this off, sorry. 
Okay. Um, now, what happened next is very interesting, and this is characteristic. Namely, commercializers grabbed it. You see this thing on the bottom there, moto bag. Commercializers, commercializing, commercializing people grabbed it. It was available for free from this guy. He did not protect it. And they did not mention him. So as far as everybody was concerned, and as far as governmental statistics were concerned, ah, the moto bag company did this, right? So our statistics are distorted. And because, again, currently, the only time an innovation exists according to statistics, and we're now getting this changed, is when it goes onto the market, right? So here's this guy, he develops, but he doesn't put it on the market. Who puts it on the market? Motobag, they say, aha, look, those producers are such geniuses, they did it again, right? That's how the data works. Okay, there are many other examples. I mean, users are doing things like developing the artificial pancreas ahead of producers. Uh, you know, you all have your own examples. But here's what's going on. There are really two major innovation paradigms operating in parallel these days. One is normally open and one is normally closed. So the top arrow is the one I described to you when I say people innovate for themselves as consumers. They collaborate with others, as you all know, with open source software or open source hardware. And then they diffuse the design peer to peer. They say, hey, you know, whatever, take it if you want because they don't protect it. Now, it's totally different. The bottom line is the producer innovation paradigm. And what we have there is this kind of interesting thing where it's all about the money. This is the Schumpeterian thing. This is Schumpeter saying you do market research, the consumers just sit there, the companies spend money for R&D, the companies spend money for production, and they sell it for a profit. And in order to do so, they need patents and intellectual property protection and all the rest of it, right? But now we have this interesting conundrum. What we see is user consumers innovating and not protecting their innovations and finding it worthwhile. In other words, they are not being either uh, religious about this or socially concerned or anything else. What they are doing is what makes best sense to them. And that is a wonderful platform to build sort of the open source hardware system upon. So let me go into that for a minute. Why can consumer innovators, consumer innovators innovate on their own free time and using their own money? We've all gone into the basement or wherever we have a, have a little workshop set up and we've done this sort of thing, right? We've built stuff. Nobody's paying us to do it. It's leisure time. Why are we doing it? We did surveys of this. Well, I want to use it myself. I want to help others. I have fun developing it. You never saw anybody going down to the basement saying, oh, curses, I have to have fun again, right? <laughs> and then they uh, learn from developing it. You know, a lot of people say, well, I want to learn uh, software or hardware to use X, Y, or Z, and so, that's an incentive to innovate, too. Only a small fraction of the motive is to make money. And when you do a sort of cluster analysis of the people who and their motives, what you find is that all these entire populations in these countries, this is Finland, you've got these users. The blue is personal need. Fun and learning is, is uh, green. And what you see there first is that you've got users, 37% of the population of all innovators. Participators, they're doing it for fun. They're the ones building supercomputers and alloy tin, right? Not very useful, but God damn it, I did it. And then, and then you've got helpers. You've got people saying, I see somebody else with a problem, you know? I'm going to make myself or them a diabetes device that will help them. And then finally you have people who are the household sector entrepreneurs of tomorrow. They're the ones saying, they're only 9% of this population. They're the ones saying, hey, maybe I better protect this. I'm going to make some money from it down the road. So in other words, this whole tens of millions of people 
spending tens of billions of dollars in just these few countries we've measured so far, they are doing it for self-reward. Now that's kind of interesting. Nobody has to pay them. So you don't have to get into, how do I protect myself? It's the lowest cost choice for consumers who don't want to sell something. Why? Because if you invent something, you can just throw it out on the web for free. You don't have to patent. That costs money. To protect something costs money. You just throw it out there. There's no need to invest to keep your innovation from others. The kinds of wonderful things that we see on the web now, you know, fathers and mothers who have a kid who has diabetes and they develop a, a, an improved device for that kid, they're not rivals with other parents who have diabetic kids. They'll be happy if the other people pick it up for free, right? And then finally, there is what some might consider the downside, no way to share in the profits if others commercialize what you developed. But you were sufficiently incented to do it without getting profits from others. So society is perfectly happy with this. Social welfare says, hey, this is fine. It's fine in two senses. If somebody else comes along and makes a factory and makes billions of dollars on what you developed, fine. They invested to do the next steps in the process to commercialize it. But also fine, you got what you wanted when you developed it for your own self-reward purposes. And finally, nobody's saying you can't commercialize too. Right? Nobody's keeping you from saying, hey, I want to make money from this too. So what it is, is people make choices. And the choices they make, they're free to make. In my case, I have hacked on a, on a device to, to uh, protect my own tendon. It's, it's better, than, better than the commercial devices because I had a strained tendon. Uh, I went into the, the surgeon. I said, hey, listen, this is better than what you got. He said, fine, that's wonderful. I said, do you want to have it? He said, no. I said, why? He says, because it's not FDA approved. Well, OK. Some commercializer has to do that. But my own opportunity costs are just to throw it out there in the web, and I don't want to deal with it further. I've got other stuff to do. All personal choice. Now, when you get into it, and if you think about trying to sort of interact between these uh, two paradigms. What you'll see is, and, and I will briefly go over this, because how much time have I got anyway? Uh, I don't know how much time I have. Um, I guess I have, what do I have? I have 15 minutes, right? OK, so, so basically, I've got a free book out there, convinced MIT Press that if they gave it away free, they'd make so much more money. God. It's fabulous. <laughs> they bought it again. But anyway, <laughs> so you can download it for free. But anyway, in there, it explains all these interactions. You know, you, you, for instance, mountain biking, right? What you've got is you've got a way to figure out, well, users do develop this stuff first, like sports equipment, medical equipment, whatever it is. So let's us as a producer be alert to picking those things up, right? Ways to do it. Fabulous sort of free kinds of uh, uh, compliments to commercial stuff. Sticking with bikes again, the free innovators, the user innovators, the consumers, the bikers, were the ones who develop all this stuff in hardware. And companies grab it because they can make money from it. But at the same time, these users also develop mountain biking techniques. Because what damn good is a mountain bike without interesting things to do in riding it? There's no market in there for commercial producers. So what you've really got is the commercial producers 
being complimented, that is, getting added value out of their bike sales because of techniques that users provide for free. Well, I'll quickly jump over this because we've got other stuff to do. And well, um, but anyway, producers also can figure out how to create workshops for users to interact, consumers, you know, and feed into these systems more directly like uh, Steam Workshop and video games and so on. Okay, so if you're interested in consumer goods, that sort of explains the underlying economics. It's a better thing whether or not, you know, I'm always highly motivated by people at the Berkman Center and by people like you who have such nice social sort of motivations. I'm, I'm attributing them to you, all of you. You are so wonderful, may I say. But the interesting thing here is that you should know that your movement does not depend on these forms of motivations. It actually pays for these consumer innovators to go free, as I explained. And so, for that reason, your movement can be robust and huge. You know, when there are tens of millions of people out there, and you've got a few hundred in this society, hey, room to grow, right? Now, let's talk again about producers. Producers have been the ones who are not supposed to be open. They're supposed to tie things down with patents because they need to make money from a monopoly. Well. Recently, what's happened is open is also paying for producers when it's about the inputs they purchase. So let me explain. Many of you probably know about the open source data center hardware thing uh, that uh, Facebook, Google, and others set up, right? Do you know about that? How many of you know about that? You're saying no. <laughs> Well, so basically what it is, is you have all these companies sitting there, and it's easier and easier to collaborate, as the consumer innovators have shown. And they're all sitting there buying a proprietary design of, let's say, data center servers, right? And so they're all paying IBM or somebody money for that proprietary design. So they look around to each other and they say, why the heck are we doing this? What we should do, since we're all buying the same kind of data center hardware, what we all really ought to do is get together and make it in an open source design, right? So that's the logic behind this kind of thing. And more detail what they're doing, here's the basic story. So you have at the bottom, you have IBM, right? And then you have this group of companies that all buy, let's say, server software from IBM. And they say, hell, let's get together and make an open design and we'll just sort of create white box hardware that can be produced by anybody. The interesting, th and they, you know, we've done papers and modeling and showing that this really pays. And then what we have is the next layer who says, well, wait a minute, the kinds of things that other, that these producers, the inputs to us that we hold in common, we could do the same thing. So what you have is each level of company in a supply chain looks at the firms it's buying from and says, wait a minute, that input is really expensive. Hey, let's make it open source. But those companies are also vulnerable because what they produce in the supply chain is inputs to the next people up. And those people are looking at it too and saying, well, wait a minute now, why don't we go open? So the trend is that we're going open on the commercial side too, which is fabulous. And free riders and so on pay. I mean, you know, I won't go into the details of it, but basically, um, you know, if you freely reveal something really, especially in hardware, something really happens interesting. You know, people are always concerned about free riders, people who get to use stuff without paying for it. 
But when companies put out a design that's open, the interesting thing that happens is they destroy the design market of the proprietary producers. So they push everything towards open. It's fabulous. It's really, it's really great. So again, on the commercial side, what you've got here is, is uh, uh, amongst producers, what you've got again is this general shift towards open. This creates a huge community chance for you. Now, what can producers do when they can no longer compete on proprietary designs? Well, they can compete on something else, maybe, but it's very possible that producers, these giant corporations that have too much power and concentration and so on, are going to be severely damaged over the next 20 years and become less important. Because, you know, the conventional argument is, well, producers have an advantage in better production capabilities. But you know what? They're offering those capabilities to open source people who want to produce just small numbers of items. Economies of scale and production. Hey, but again, you know, a lot of these economies of scale are available in mass customization, like Foxconn and so on. Better distribution sometimes. Well, yeah, but better savings on local production for local use. Or popular brands. Somebody mentioned brands here. Yeah, but brands like Linux and Apache can be pretty cool too. And they're just growing organically. So it's all enormously fabulous. Did I mention it's enormously fabulous? And uh, uh, that's the story. So, so there are examples out there I won't go into where, in fact, people are already going entirely without producers in the hardware space. People are building, for instance, artificial hands for children. They have a network around the world of people who will print locally for children uh, uh, these designs in the right size and so on. And they're competing with producers who sell $7,000 myoelectric arms versus $35 hands. So it's all fabulous things are going in the right direction. And I will shut up. So here's, here's the book that you can get for free and make MIT Press happy because you didn't pay them anything. And if you're interested in learning about that, but at least you're sort of aware of what's there. OK, that's, that's the end of my story. Thank you very much. Thank you.